happening? Because my mic was not on. Oh, my God. So, let's begin again. Thank you, everybody. There we go. Peace to you all, and good morning. Welcome to Not Church. No doctrine, no dogma, just mysticism. I'm called Reverend Peter Panagor, MDiv. Call me Peter. That's just so that you know I've got credentials. Suffering begins to end when in the dark night of our souls, our minds grow tired of desire and reasoning. Today, we're going to talk about the fasting of the heart, the wisdom of unknowing. It's a greater pleasure. It's purgation, illumination, and it leads to union. The goal of not church, it isn't knowledge. The goal is unknowing. And you can read all the books you want on mysticism. Got a stack of them over here and another stack of them over there. And I whack my mic at the same time. And I got a bunch of them over there and that shelving. And there are libraries full of them. And you can read them all if you want to. And that's good because they fill your head with wisdom. Well, other people's wisdom, actually. The holy thoughts of mystics like Lao Tzu and Patanjali and Rumi and Hafez, Jesus, Teresa of Siena, and among hundreds of others of ancient wisdom writers. And you can learn about what they thought. And these teachers, they fill our heads with understanding and wonder. And you you hear them quoted here on Sundays, and you hear them quoted and discussed on Mondays and Wednesdays during our Centering Prayer practice live on YouTube, and you are welcome to join us. And we begin each Sunday morning with a brief Centering Prayer practice before we get into the deeper things that I just mentioned a moment ago in order to energize and tune up and tune into, tune into, the frequency of the mysterious, illuminative presence of the radiant light. And Jesus said, as you know, where there are two or three gathered, I'm there. Where two are gathered, there are three. Where three are gathered, there are five. And it just magnifies. The magnification power of the light among us is only limited by the clarity of our individual lenses. That's what the practice is all about, to clean the lens, to polish the lens. When we practice together, we illuminate each other. As Pantanjali, the writer of the Yoga Sutras, teaches, let's begin with Aum, Aum, the sound of the divine. Now, somebody asked me this week, should Christians pray Aum? Well, yeah, I didn't for the longest time because I was, well, I wanted to keep my job in the church. And I had a buddy who became, uh, joined the Unification Church. He got kicked out. That was a lesson to me. Keep my mouth quiet about the things that aren't theologically acceptable. But yes, let's begin with the OM. Maybe you should pick up the practice. Maybe it'll help you like it's helped me. This begins with a belly breath and it fills up the lungs and we release the belly first and then the lungs second and we slowly empty ourselves as we a here uh, oh, mm, resonating in right up to the third eye. And we follow this this morning with after three ohms, relaxing with centering prayer breath which is basically belly breathing. If you ever sang or you ever danced um, or you ever public spoke, it's all about the belly breath while holding your prayer mantra, your chant on your breath like a chickadee on your palm. 
No sudden mental moves, just the calmness of your heart, the gentleness of the movement of your breath, and the peacefulness of your mind. And when your mind wanders, you simply come back to your prayer again, to your chant. If you go to the description below, you'll find links to the basic practice that you can pick up on later today or this week. We practice together because when we do so, the light is magnified. And I go through all this every single Sunday morning for the sake of the new people who've come to join us to let you know that you're welcome to join us in this practice and that you might discover what we have discovered, that when two or three are gathered, the light is brighter for all of us. And our meditation is so much deeper and radiant together. So we begin with a little bit of meditation before we begin into the discussion this morning. So stick around for the chat after. Bring your light with you right now and you'll see for yourself. So let's take a minute or so. Uh, Belinda, there's no place like Om. Da -dum -bum. Oh, that's very funny. Uh, <laughs> hello, people from around. I see uh, Rob's here and Cal Extra from the UK. And that was very funny. There's no place like home, the energy room, and Anna, and Alfred, and primary feathers, and Rob over there in the in Wales, and anyway, so you made me laugh. That was funny. All right, so here we go. Feet on the floor, hands on my lap. I usually do this, doo -doo, just like that. Um, thumbs up against my belly. I don't always do that, but often enough. So here we go. Belly breath. Fill your lungs. Our suffering of ignorance here below the veil begins to end when, in the dark night of our souls, of our minds, and the, when that dark night, well, when we begin to grow tired in that dark night of desire and reasoning because we cannot reason our way to God. Knowledge isn't going to bring us there. An accumulation 
of all of the knowledge and all of the mystical books ultimately won't help us. Book knowledge isn't wisdom. Belief isn't wisdom. Rules, laws, doctrines, and dogmas, they're more like constraints, like handcuffs. These aren't wisdom. Knowledge may be a weapon. Sometimes it is of oppression. But it is in wisdom. The beginning of wisdom comes in the suffering of the dark night of our souls when our minds tire of desire and reasoning. Desire and reasoning, they aren't bad or wrong or evil, and neither is reading all the books. They simply are eternally fruitless. They don't attach us to the vine. They don't dunk us in the river. They can't satisfy the empty places inside us. It's like knowing everything there is to know about the river. Its origin, its depth, its temperature, its chemical makeup, its flow, where it goes, how it gets there. But never getting wet, never getting in the water. These things, desire and reasoning, they're not bad. They just can't satisfy us. So what can? That's, that, and that's one thing you can learn from the ancients is that all these things that, with, that are things, none of those things can or will ever satisfy us. Unknowing is the beginning of wisdom. Unknowing is a Taoist mystical metaphor so similar to the end of reasoning and desire to the dark night of the soul. Because unknowing arises, the desire for unknowing arises when one realizes reasoning and desire simply won't do. And unfortunately, what breaks us open? Suffering is what breaks us open. And you may ask, and you probably have, why, if God is love, is there suffering? And we've talked about this in some places, but asking an unanswerable question that arises in the grasping mind will do you no good and only lead to frustration, which only leads to more suffering. Why ask why when no one in the history of humanity has ever offered or can ever offer a fully reasoned reply. And at the end of the book of Job, Job asks God, why do I suffer? God's reply is a non-answer that, well, it amounts to, it means, Job, your silly little human brain is way too small to comprehend the vastness of me. That's the answer. We don't understand. Long, long ago, I stopped asking why is there suffering and just accepted that there is. It's like trying to focus on laying the blame when a problem arises rather than trying to fix the problem. Why waste the time and energy on something that you can't ever answer? But here's the thing. Along the way, I learned how to fix the problem. I haven't eliminated my suffering. But I've learned to live with it and live above it. And yeah, I had a kickstart. Near-death experience will do that to you. But I've still put in the years of work. 
The fasting of the heart is a practice of unknowing that starts on the level of thoughts. In Christian classical talk, the fasting of the heart is the purgation of the soul. The true fasting of the heart is the abstinence, and here's the, here's the thing, it's the abstinence of thinking. The fasting of the heart is the abstinence of thinking. It's the thing we talk about all the time here. It's the practice of centering prayer. It's the practice of meditation. It's the practice of contemplation. It's the practice of Kriya. However you're using your technique to abstain from thinking is a fasting of the heart. It's also called the fasting of thoughts. Classical Christian misinterpretation believes that abstinence, asceticism, and self-denial lead to the humility of an empty heart, when in reality the inverse is true. The fasting of your heart, the fasting from thinking, is the fastest way to purgation of what really matters and leads to a loving, naturally arising morality of kindness arising in the human heart from the elimination of the egoic self, from the quieting of our desire and reasoning, which leads to, wonderfully, the second stage of Christian classical mysticism, illumination. Illumination in Christian, Christian language, mystical language, it shows itself, it manifests itself. You can see it in your own life and the deepening of your prayer life, in spontaneous kindness, love, and a surrender to the beloved, with a capital B, and a desire for a more full union. So the desire changes for, from things to the thingless, from things to the nothing. A union, a desire for union. And in this stage, consolations, in this stage of once, once you begin your fasting of the heart and you practice it for a long enough time and you've learned to quiet the monkey mind, this stage comes with consolations, blessings, and mystical phenomena, serendipities, out-of-body experiences, the divine presence, all sorts of mystical phenomena, consolations, and blessings occur in this stage. The more you fast from your thought, the more we learn to unknow. And funny that these consolations, blessings, and mystical phenomena are more likely to occur in this stage, not because you desire them, but precisely because you don't. They come on their own. They arise from the connection, from the quieting of the mind, from learning to unknow. This is the greater pleasure. The greater pleasure isn't in the things, as fun as they can be, and they're not bad or wrong. It's just that they are not eternal. They don't last forever. The final stage that comes from learning to unknow, from the practice of the fasting of your heart, is the unitive state, called enlightenment, a habitual union with the beloved, characterized by maybe a deep joy, maybe a profound humility, maybe freedom from the fears of suffering. It doesn't end suffering, but it releases us from our fear of suffering or of our trials and gives us a greater desire to serve the beloved. And the fruitfulness of, of spirituality comes from the connectedness to the Spirit, capital S. The greatest use of the law of divine attraction is the aiming of the heart at the divine. Attract that which is the oneness of being. 
And all these fruits come as a result. And all of this starts when we realize that our desires and our attachments and our reasoning can't bring us to the holy. Fasting of the heart attracts the holy to live inside you, to permeate you, to radiate from you and rule your life. In the Christian language I grew up with, put Jesus on the, on the throne of your heart. Put the holy and the throne of your heart fast on a regular basis from thinking who you are. In the unitive state, this enlightenment, the experience of the presence of the divine is almost continual. Almost continual. And it comes with great insight into the wisdom of the I am because it's experienced directly. And it's not without suffering because, heck, the whole world is full of suffering. But suffering becomes, well, just the way it is. It's just the way it is. No longer striving and fighting against it, trying to find the reasons for it. Or desiring the end of it. Because there really is only one end of it. And that's the day you leave here. When suffering ends. When suffering ends. This is the transforming union or the spiritual marriage. The two become one and yet somehow are still separate. The only way out of here is in and wisdom comes from unknowing and wisdom begins when the chattering mind stops speaking for a moment. Do you want earthly knowledge or eternal wisdom? The wise learn to say, I don't know why there's suffering. I just quiet my mind. And I love this thing from the Gospel of Thomas, number 75. Many are standing at the door, but it is the solitary who enter the bridal chamber. Many are standing at the door, but it is the solitary who enter the bridal chamber. The many are your thoughts, your reasons, and your desires. The only one who can enter, the rest must, only one can enter, and the rest must remain outside the room, outside the divine orgasmic love union that awaits in that marriage bed, where, where union is enjoined and enjoyed. So what do you want? What do you want? And I see that someone um, rightly says, ah, oh, there are great thinkers in defense of the, of the mystical books and their writings. I read them because they feed my head. I definitely do. But they all teach that the only way to know the divine is to seek it inside yourself in silence of your mind. It's the only way to do it. I mean, I have a library full of those books. I've spent my life reading them. I encourage you to read them. But make sure that you know that knowing them isn't the same thing as being known by the knower. It's not. You can have all the book knowledge in the history of the world right inside your noggin. And without deep practice, you can't take it with you. But this, you definitely can take with you. My whole purpose here this morning is to encourage you to ever deepen your mystical journey. Read all the books you want. Get all the head knowledge you need. I read them all the time. I mean, obviously, I talk about them all the time. But they're only a means to understand the experience of the divine in language. Because it really only ever happens here. And the only way to do that is to fast inside your heart. Whether you're a Taoist or a Catholic Trappist like Thomas Merton, there's only one way to do it. Quiet yourself.
quiet yourself and make the space for the divine within. I didn't make up the rules. I'm just following them. Thank you, Carmen, very much. Thank you, David. Uh, some say we choose our life path, including the suffering before we were born. Others say it's karma. Others, the law of attraction. Uh, have your NDE or experiences given you insight into these views? Yes, as a matter of fact, yes. When I came back my first time from my first death, I chose which life I was going to live. I was coming back to the same body, but I was going to, ch I chose the life I was going to live inside this body. Now, is that true for when I, before I was born into this body, be you know, when, before I was a baby, baby Peter? Um, I don't know. That's beyond my knowledge, but I can say that I've traveled enough in other countries and seen such great suffering in hospitals that I got to wonder whether someone would choose to live a life where horrible warlike devastation happens to you personally. What kind of, well, it's just, uh, I don't even ask those questions. Did I choose this path? I can't know that. I can only guess. I know that I chose the life I'm living now. That I choose the to be born as Peter in the first place. I don't know. Does it matter? Do I spend my life trying to answer that question? Or do I spend my life getting rid of the Peter the, who, who, who isn't really me anyway? Is it karma? Is it choice? It's To me, it's like theology. We're all guessing. Theology is all about guessing. Mysticism, mysticism is about experience and the understanding that all knowledge is partial and that there's much more that we don't understand than we do understand, that my ignorance is vaster than my knowledge, that my ignorance is vaster than my wisdom, and that the only wisdom that I have available to me is the connectivity to the divine itself. I know people want to know why they're here and what their purpose is. And did they choose this suffering life? Did I choose my cancer? Did I not choose my cancer? If it helps you think that, if it helps you to face your cancer, to think that you chose it, that's okay. But you know, the little kid that I saw, who was a beggar, whose belly was distended by hunger, whose hair was copper because of starvation, whose family was brutalized. When I was traveling in I, probably Nicaragua that time, that little kid, did he choose his suffering? Maybe. Did that help him if he knew that? No, it did not. I think it's one of those questions that people want to know the answer to, that it's fruitless to ask. That's just my opinion. Because what's fruitful, what's fruitful in this is for us to aim our heart at the divine and to fast inside our hearts, to connect to the oneness of being in order not just to have our own navel gazing experience of life, but then to live in the world to help others face their suffering and to help us face our suffering. I'm not sure that's the right answer for you, my friend David, but... Um, I try not to answer questions I cannot. I try to only seek the oneness of being. Because, because I am not this person. I am not Peter. I, every day of my life, I know that I am not Peter. Every breath I take, I know my suffering will end. And as for learning in this life, when I was dead, I, I anything I wanted to know, I knew. To me, this is the ignorant place. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, JT. All the relationships of our experience of love we take with us when we go back home, that's what happened to me. All the relationships of love that I experienced in life, that was my key to the, to the kingdom of heaven. It was my key that opened the pearly gates. It was the 
Love was the treasure that I carried with me. Not because I created this love, because I didn't. I just shared what was from the great storehouse of love, which flows down through. And I collected the love that was given to me. You don't need to meditate your way into heaven. You don't. You don't need to listen to anything I say. Just need to love each other. That's the beauty of the whole system. We just need to love. Now, if you want more, then yes, you can dive within. And when you dive within, this radiance of the divine presence becomes the living thing in your life and permeates everything you do. Thank you, Capital One. <sighs> Thank you. Uh, the new Peter chose this path. <laughs> yeah, the new Peter chose this path, says JT. That's kind of true. I did, but I chose it when I was sort of coming, as, as I was leaving my soul self and weaving back into my astral self as I was projecting back into my body, being projected like a rocket ship back into my body again. Hey, I want to say that if uh, not churches ever touches you or helps you or makes you think, if I only make you think, I'm not the answer man. I'm not like the guru, G. I am just a guy on my spiritual journey trying to communicate the divine presence that lives inside of me and to seek the oneness of being for myself and to share it to get out of the way so it can share itself through my imperfect self. But if Not Church has ever touched you, Not Church has ever touched you or helped you grow spiritually, please subscribe, click the alert button, like the video, tell your friends about us. This is a great place to have spiritual conversation. We're going to meet at the top of the hour for Not, I mean, for Mystic Tea Salon. Don't forget about that. That's at peterpanagor.love. Mystic Tea Salon at the top of the hour. It's a Zoom thing. And I want to thank everybody who gave support last week through PayPal, Venmo, Patreon, and here on Super Chat today and last week on Super Chat. I'm definitely here just trying to help you. As I'm seeking my own way back to where I came from. Peter, if death is the end of suffering, and I believe it is. Why do we cling to life so much? Oh, there's this blind darkness. Everybody's afraid of dying. It's, it was a Jimmy Cliff. Every, I think it was Jimmy Cliff, the, the reggae singer. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody want to die. <laughs> um, people are afraid of death because it's dark. They don't see what it is. I was too. I was petrified petrified the first time I died. The second time, I was like, take me home, honey. I'm ready to go. But yeah, people are afraid of dying. People are afraid of death. I'm not afraid anymore. At all. Zero. For 40 years. And then 2015, when I died again, I finally got the proof of that. Or rather, the people around me saw the proof of what I'd been saying. Kate, it's so helpful uh, to know that we're loved completely. You are loved completely either way. You know, when it says no one is worthy of the kingdom of heaven, according to the Bible, according to the theologians, it's because nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect in love except for divine love. And the beauty is because of the perfection of divine love, we're all beloved as we are right now, who we are as we are right now. No matter what, you are beloved. It's just this most beautiful thing. Uh, I just love the sharing today of the divine within and our spiritual union and the fasting of the heart. What a living experience. Thank you, Alfred. I'm going to take a sip of tea here. Mm. Uh, suffering I found to be a great teacher, says Carmen. Give God your suffering and he will give you himself. Summary statement. Give the divine your suffering and you gain the divine self. That's it. That's it. Selflessness. 
not clinging to suffering. It's a form of selflessness. That's what that's all about. That's why we give our burdens to Jesus in the Christian theology. Give your burden to Jesus. Let Jesus carry your burden. Why? Because it's selfless. You lose yourself in the process. He was brilliant, that guy. Jesus, I mean. That's how I see it. I am a seeker looking for experience of the divine, but all I know, as real as this life, which is why I am so clingy. The deeper you go, Rob, the less clingy you become. And I know that this is a long process, okay? Nobody said this is easy. It's a lifelong process. But the beauty of the practice is, is that the deeper you go into it, you get these blessings and consolations and mystical experiences. They come, Rob. They do. You keep at it. They come. They naturally arise from the process. How long it takes, your guess is as good as mine. But the grace comes. And I think what you said, all you know is this world. I think that's why people are afraid of death. I was. I definitely was. Petrified. Terrified. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Carla. Thank you very much. Um, Hello. Hola. Hey, Manuel Lopez. Hello. Hello. I love that. That's beautiful. Um, I love that. Um, Colleen, I am no longer afraid to die after listening to NDEs. Just want to do my best to do no harm on the earth. Yeah, it's really hard to do no harm. Yeah, hum are you a human being? You're going to do harm. It's a matter of measure. It's a matter of quantity, maybe even quality of harm. But the more you fast inside your heart and cling to the divine, the more you see the harm you do, the less harm you do. We do as little as we can, and we love as much as we can, and we do the best we can. And because the Creator knows this about us, it's easy to forgive us. It's easy to forgive us for being human when the Creator made us this way. Do as little harm as possible. Hurt as few people as you can. Know that you're going to hurt people. Ask for forgiveness. Give forgiveness. And if you can't get forgiveness, well, I think one of the things Jesus said, something like uh, brush the dust from your feet, turn around and walk away. If you can't, if you can't get forgiveness, just keep going and try better next time. That's all. Thanks so luminosity. Namaste and peace to you too. Uh, join Mystic Tea Salon after um, at Catherine. Peter, can you speak on the subject and art of forgiveness one day? I've spoken uh, to the Ho'opo'o, oh, wait, I know that word. Ho'opo'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o'o
The only thing standing in the way between you and peace is you, is me. I'm the only thing in my way. There's nothing else in my way. I am in my own way. And the peace is an accumulative thing. A little bit now, a little bit now, a little bit now. And that little bit now, it stays with you. Every time you get a little bit now, you get a little, your pile gets bigger. It takes practice. I wish it wasn't so, but it is. It takes practice. Peter, as much as I love your monologues, the spiritual ping pong when you engage with the listeners is stunningly moving. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I really prefer the ping pong myself. It's much more fun. Um, you know, sometimes I swipe that ball and I miss it. And sometimes it hits me in the nose. And sometimes I nail it over the fence, over that little net. And uh, I, I used to play ping pong. A long time ago but I, I i the whole monologue thing is 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 to get us to a conversation that's the whole plan behind not church okay the plan behind not church was 10 minutes 10 minutes of talking the rest of the time for conversation um i don't know i'm probably not quite doing that now because we've added so many things in but uh, i much prefer the conversation myself steve thanks it's much more fun and uh real a wonderful message, much needed this day. Thank you, GPS. Uh, Ariane, thank you. Uh, Russell, even though doing good can do unintentional harm as its effects ripple out through space and time, just do it. Even, oh, even doing good can do unintentional harm as its effects ripple out through space and time, just do it. It's true. You know, what, what, if I help you, sometimes when I help you, I end up hurting somebody else. You can't control for those factors. Talk about getting locked up into like inaction. Oh my God, if I do this thing, I'm going to do that thing. And this, you, then you, nothing ever gets done. Nobody ever gets helped. Um, you can only, it's like my grandmother used to put love into her. She would knead up the bread with your special ingredient. Yeah, yeah, grandma. Oh, it's love, Peter. Petros, it's love. Um, you can only put love into your actions and let the chips fall where they may. Know that when you help somebody, you might hurt somebody. That's, that's what happens. But the love doesn't get eliminated. The love continues to ripple out. Uh, great topic for forgiveness. Yes, we'll put that down for sure. Um, you're welcome, Cal Extra. Thank you for your answer, Peter, and for everything you do here. You're welcome, David. Thank you very much. Uh, just like I said, I, I'm just a, a a schmo, a schmo trying to do it, live my life, um, and uh, live the contemplative mystical life in my interior in the context of the world, and try to. My real, my, my real goal is to be a channel of the peace. St. Francis, make me a channel of your peace. That's really all I want to be. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a channel of peace. Kid, get a job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it doesn't pay well, but the, but the eternal benefits are spectacular. <laughs> um. I don't know if that was funny for you, but it was funny for me. The way you share your message is full of compassion, encouragement, strength to those who choose to integrate in their own consciousness. Blessings, fellow NDE brother. Thank you, Ruth. Um, compassion, humility, forgiveness, non-judgment, all arise from the fasting of the heart. These are the blessings and the consolations and the gifts. These things come when self is lessened, when attachment uh, to reason and desire for result are eliminated. These things arise naturally because they are who you are already. It's not so much that there are new things added to us, so much as the old crappy stuff, the crust that's in the way, the veils of thickness get peeled away, and these things just come out on their own. 
you know, that, that old trope, um, with Jesus in the sand, there's two foot, two, two footprints in the sand. And suddenly there's one set of footprints in the sand. That, that's when I was carrying you, says Jesus. Um, totally true. Be carried by the divine, by giving up yourself. And all these things, the radiance of the presence of the divine speaks through your hands then. It comes through your throat. It, it emanates from your eyes. It radiates into your life. And all these blessings arise from it. From not desiring, from not trying to reason your way out, just from attaching to it. So long, so, so let me ask you this. Hi, Vicky. Thank you, Vicky, very much. Oh, thanks, Charlie. It's trying to be funny. Um, so how old is writing? When was cuneiform first written? You know, when I was traveling in Turkey a long time ago, I, I ended up at the very first art school in the world, at least the, the Western world. And there was cuneiform. And uh, what is it? Maybe 5,000 years old? I'd have to look up the real date. But say, say it's 5,000 years old. Writing is, say, 5,000 years. Do you think that human beings discovered the divine connection just 5,000 years ago? What did they do before they had books? They were still connecting to the holy, still connecting to the divine, still connecting to the oneness of being. You don't need books. You need connection. You need love. You need selflessness. The end of duality, the, the connection to the oneness of being, the fasting of the heart. These things don't take education. They take practice. It's been around for longer than humanity has walked the earth. It's pretty powerful. It's the most powerful thing there is. And when we join in this together, walls are eliminated. Enemies become friends. Belief systems disappear. Because what matters more than belief systems, who's right and who's wrong, is who's loving, who's caring, who's kind, who's selfless. Those don't know political party. They don't know cultural construct. They don't know religion. They know humanity. They know love. Much love and blessings to everyone. So grateful for the insights and love shared here today. Thanks, Belinda Barbo. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, MG. Uh, St. Francis Prayer, my fave too, Wanda. Make me a channel of your peace. If you don't know that prayer, uh, it's worth looking up. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is ignorance, and on it goes. Let me so I don't remember the next line. Somebody else does. Um, glorious divine. I'm a glorious divine schmuck. Yes, I am a. Uh, that's why I love the clown. I love. I know lots of people don't like the clown, like as a thing, because it's scary for a lot of people. But I like the fool. I like the fool in Shakespeare because the fool is always the wisest person in the in the in the play. Um, the clown can be the wisest person too. Uh, I'm definitely just a, a schmuck for God. That's my job. I'm like God's janitor. Or, uh, yeah, cleaning up my own mess. That's what I do. I clean up my own mess inside myself. I think cuneiform is from 3000 BC. Thanks, Carl. I, that's kind of what I thought it was. So that's about 6,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Yes, mystics who were illiterate. Yep. Don't need to be liter literate. You don't. Um, they look deeply within and deeply into each other's eyes and just knew. Yep. You look inside someone's eyes and you stop thinking of yourself. You see the light. Especially if they are doing the same with you. You can block it. You can pretend that it's not there. Or you can open up the gates and let it flow out. 
so much effort to keep the gates down. It takes so much energy. Uh, the, let's see what else. My mother used to say, you read too many magazines as in just believe in yourself. Knowledge is a good thing. I read a lot of magazines. But none of them help me find the divine ultimately. The only thing that does that to me. Why have I spent my entire life, 40 freaking years, in meditative practice? Talk about unproductive use of time. How much time? I wonder if I, if I piled up all the time I, I spent sitting or doing yoga, being unproductive or walking in the woods in nature, or sitting by a stream listening. Unproductive time. What are you doing with your life, young man? Old man. But those are the times. Those are the places where the eternal treasure mounts up inside us and rests in our palms like a piling heap of gold dust ready to be shared with anyone who needs it. And there's always more. It's never ending. You never run out. So give it away. Pile it up and give it away. Am I wrong? Was not fasting the word? Um... And I uh, wants you to talk more about fasting. Yeah, so fasting of the heart, and I'm checking the time here. We've got a few more minutes left. Fasting of the heart has to do with, it. fasting in the heart is fasting of thinking. We take, I, I used to fast when I was younger. I probably, should, I, prob I probably could use a little fasting now. Um, but I used to fast fairly regularly. Um, mostly before I had kids. Now that I don't really have an excuse anymore because the kids aren't around. Um, but fasting is this self-denial, right? You deny yourself the thing you des your body craves. Fasting of the heart is fasting of thinking. You deny your mind the thing it craves. The thing it craves is itself. The story it tells itself. The fasting of the heart, the fasting from thinking, is a practice of silence. It's centering prayer, or by any other name, contemplative meditation, um, what the dervishes do, you know, one hand down, one hand up, spinning, tai chi, whatever form it takes where you cease with intent and breath to focus on yourself, you fast from your thinking. That's what meditation is. Meditation is a fast from thinking. And the reason why it's fasting in the heart is because if the heart is aimed towards the oneness of being, towards the beloved inside the bedroom chamber waiting for you, all hot and bothered for you, that's where the connection happens. When self ceases to be in the way where the two merge into one, where self no longer matters. It's a scary thing to give up yourself until you realize you're not who you thought you were. And then it becomes what you want. It's hard to give up myself, but to do that unless there is two selves, one giving up the other, so that's no good. Now you give up yourself. You give up yourself and you find who you are because this person, Peter, my Peterness, it's not me. This is where I live. This is my rental unit. This is my Airbnb. I'm a temporary visitor inside this thing of mine, this thing of mine, which isn't really mine because I'm going to leave it behind when I die. Ashes to ashes, worms come and eat me. 
you know, bacteria dis dispose of me, of this body, but not of me. The me who really is me, the one I, s I know that I am, it doesn't need Peter. Peter's just a tool to use here. The reason why you read all of the wisdom books in the history of the world, all of Rumi and Kafir and Jesus, is to let you know that you're not alone in this process. Let you know that others went before you and walked this path. There is value in those books. If the only value you find in those books is to know that others walked the path before you, that's enough to keep you going. The loss of self is the, the loss of self with a little s is the gain of self with a capital S. But from this side of the veil, you can't even see the capital S. And the little s says, no, 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 I can't see beyond the veil. I'm all there is. Ah! Until it parts, becomes permeable. And then you discover that little ass was lying to you. It was just fearful, that's all. Not lying with vindictiveness, just afraid. That's all. Well, my friends, it's um, been... If I could add, okay, if I could add, I know that 60 minus 2 is 58. It's been in the numbers right in front of me. It's been 58 minutes. I only have a couple minutes left. Um, so I'm going to say peace and love to you all and namaste. Like the video. Thanks for the support. Meet me at the Zoom Mystic Tea Salon. I'll see you next week. Thanks for showing up and listening to me. Um, Send me your subjects that you want to talk about. I want to talk about what you want to hear about. Uh, bless you all, right? Little scared ego. That little ego is such a scaredy cat. Um, Merton, Thomas Merton, true self versus false self. That's right. False self, little s, true self, capital S. Totally true. Um, thanks, Colleen. See you in not church, everybody. I'll see you in a couple of minutes, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it on, and then I'm going to say... Um, I'm going to step outside for a minute. I'll be right back in. All right. Peace and love, everybody. Namaste. Peace.